Welcome to Satsang. We'll begin this this beautiful, beautiful time together with a question that has come in advance. And then we'll open it up to any, any questions that anyone here has. Since unrest is such a motivating force, isn't it okay to be dissatisfied with your situation and not accept it as God's will? Some of the best things were invented because someone did not like the way things are. So just to repeat that, it was a bit long. Basically, the question is, do we have to accept everything as God's will? Or is it okay to be dissatisfied because while... Many wonderful things were invented by someone who didn't like the way things were, so they invented something different. There's two layers of existence. There's actually many layers, but we'll we'll categorize them into two categories for the, the simplicity of a short satsang rather than a one-year course on levels of being and consciousness. And the two layers are, we could call them the physical level, and then we could call them the spiritual level. So we've got both of those two levels, two layers. Each of us has a physical body, bleeds if you cut it. Gets uncomfortable if you don't eat. Uncomfortable if you don't sleep. Eventually gets sick, passes away. It's a physical body, keeps changing. Then we have our soul, spirit, never born, never dies, never changes, one with all. And I, I begin this answer with that because the question is trying to take two levels, two layers, and merge them into one. And you can't really do that. We have to take both layers at the same time because they're both important. Even as we grow and expand and deepen as spiritual beings, we're not supposed to neglect the body. This is why... This is why there's such a beautiful emphasis in the spiritual world on yoga, on pranayam, on living a sattvic life, not only because it helps us spiritually, but because it takes care of our physical bodies. So even as we live as spirit, as soul, we know We've got a body, and we need to take care of it. Now, the way that these two layers show up in our life a lot is on the spiritual level, everything is perfect. There is nothing but God. Everything is God. On the physical level, 
things need to be changed. There's hungry people. There's oppressed people. Environment is being polluted and destroyed. There's so much to be done. A very simple way to think about it is you're walking down the street and somebody in front of you trips and falls. Okay? Now everything's perfect. Everything's God, right? We say, aham brahmasmi. I am God. Everything is God. And yet, this guy has fallen or this lady has fallen or this child has fallen right in front of you. Obviously, you need to bend down and help them up, even though everything's perfect. And the two of them don't cancel each other out. It's not that because I feed the hungry, I don't think everything's perfect. It's not that in planting trees, we somehow are doubting the perfection of God. We live both levels simultaneously. Everything is perfect. Everything is God. And as Bhagwan Krishna makes it so clear in the Bhagavad Gita, each of us needs to stand up and do our duty. And whether it's helping this person up off the floor, planting a tree, serving other people in so many ways, we do it. While simultaneously we realize everything is perfect and everything is God. Now, if you try in your intellectual mind to make those two things merge into one awareness, you'll make yourself kind of crazy because you can't. They don't actually go together. I mean, if everything's perfect, why help the person? If everything's perfect, why feed the hungry? If everything's perfect, why plant trees? And this is why we meditate. It's why we go deep on a spiritual path because only when we go deep can we actually experience the presence of both simultaneously and realize it's not either or. Yes, everything is God. Yes, everything is perfect. And, you know, it's like they say, right? Have faith in God and tie your camel. Right? Yes, I believe in God. But it's my only camel. I need him. I'm going to tie him up to the tree while I take a nap. So those levels, those layers are really important to have realize both of them exist simultaneously. We take care of the body even though we are the soul. We take care of other people's bodies. We feed them. We give them education. We give them medical care. We treat them with respect. Even though they are also the soul. So we live on both levels simultaneously. And that's the goal, is actually to live on both simultaneously. So then you look at this question. And you say, is it okay to be dissatisfied and not to accept everything as God's will? Well, sure, as long as you're looking at two different levels. Accepting the perfection of God should not make us complacent. I mean, otherwise, every single child in the world just has to say, well, I guess it's, you know, God's will that I fail this exam. I'm going to go out and play. Right? I mean, why study? If it's God's will that I'm going to fail, why bother studying? Tell her, let me play my sports, watch my TV, and if it's God's will for me to get a good grade, I'll get a good grade. If not, I won't. What does that mean? But we understand that, yes, God's will is flowing. Yes, there is perfection. And 
in the same way that Arjun needed to actually go out on the battlefield, draw his arrow, draw his bow with the arrow, in the same way, we need to act. So yes, dissatisfaction on that level is absolutely fine. I am deeply dissatisfied by the fact that there are children who are hungry. I mean, it's, it's a horrible situation. The idea that there's more than enough food produced. I mean, the United States alone grows enough grain to feed more than 10 billion people a day. But that grain goes to feed the chickens, the cows, and the pigs who become hamburgers, hot dogs, and chicken McNuggets instead of being used to feed people. So tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of children as well, are dying of hunger every day and we could feed them all. That makes me deeply dissatisfied. And so we work, and we serve. That dissatisfaction, whether it takes the form of pain, sadness, grief, anger, those are catalyzers. They're catalyzing emotions. They're the stuff that get us up, off our rear ends, up early in the morning, that make us work to change that with which we are dissatisfied. But at the same time, in the midst of all of it, we must also remember it's all God. It's all God. And that's why, again, we meditate. Because when I meditate, I'm no longer dissatisfied. Right? When I meditate, I touch and experience that infinite perfection. And there is no me, and there is no separate being, and there is no child dying of hunger, and there is no tree being cut down, there is just consciousness. And that enables us to serve without that stress, without that attachment, without that level of panic, because we know on a deep level, yeah, it's all God, and it's all perfect. And our dissatisfaction is part of that perfection. And I know that that may take a little while to wrap your brain around. But I think back, you know, you look back at the, the Mahabharata, right? Now, Krishna had tried to convince Duryodhan to do the honorable thing. Give him some land. I mean, he had tried. Duryodhan didn't listen. Hence, the war needed to happen. And yet, Krishna's God, right? So, obviously, if in God's perfection, he really wanted the war not to happen, he would have just made it so. He's God. So here we have those two levels again. Even in God's perfection, when God himself is here in form on earth, part of the drama, in that perfection, is Duryodhan being stubborn, being selfish, is Arjun being worried and stressed so that the Bhagavad Gita gets spoken, so that all of us can have it, 
And also, of course, so many other karmic threads that are woven into the story. So that's what's important for us to realize is our, our anger at situations, our dissatisfaction, our pain, is part of that perfection because it makes us act to restore Dharma. Because it's certainly not dharmic for kids to be dying of starvation. And so when we have that pang of anger, of sadness, of grief, we work, we serve. So allow yourself, not with your intellectual brain, but with your intuitive feeling heart with your consciousness as you meditate to just allow both levels of existence to exist simultaneously and allow yourself and your awareness to seamlessly and smoothly embrace both, live with both, flow back and forth between both. Yes, we are serving and working. And yeah, everything's perfect and it's God and we sing and we chant and we dance and we pray. And yeah, there's poverty and hunger and so we serve. And yeah, it's all perfect as we bathe in Ganga. And yet you see, you see the flow because they both exist simultaneously. Does anyone here have a question? Yes, Abkiviti. Hi, there is a little bit of context to my question. So sure, I hope I won't make no it problem. Too long. Um, so I grew up in a Christian family. So my grandfather was a pastor. I grew up like going to church and first I was going to church because my family was going then at um, teenager years, I got real uh, experiences with God and I got to know him out of my own um, inquire. And I got to, I started traveling and started met, getting to know him from other points of view and it was everything very beautiful because he is very beautiful. Um, and happens now that I'm here, <laughs> learning and learning lots of different things, like learning about him from a very different point of view than that that was um, raised upon and now because of my family my long life friends are Christians I, I've been questioned a lot like about um, if I am serving or singing like because I'm sharing with them um, so every now and then on Instagram like what's happening because it makes me extremely happy to be here <laughs> um, so I'm sharing and I'm getting a lot of questions on whether I am like serving other gods and singing to other gods to what I've been answering to them kind of like from a distance, like, oh, other gods, tell me more about this. Like, how is it to have other gods? Because I just believe in one and I, I can't really, because like it's yes. a reflection of your answer from the last satsang or from the last I, I was um, a part of. Like, yeah, I cannot control God's form and where geographically he was born in and I cannot control. So like, if you know other gods and if there's something that I'm missing out, so you let me know, but I just know one God. <laughs> but... I feel like I'm lacking maybe a little bit of discernment here. I don't know whether I should kind of tell them more about my experiences and explain in a deeper way, like how I see God now and how he has shown himself to me in so many different ways and how what I'm doing here is still like serving and learning about him himself. Beautiful. Or, if, I or if, if it would be like the Bible that I grew up reading, uh, or if it would be like throwing pearls to, to the pigs and like I would be wasting my time. So I don't know whether I would be like, I should be an evangelist on it and like go like Arjuna and fight the right on the, right on the spot and like explain to them and let them know more about it. Or if I should just like, yeah, whatever. Like, Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Did, everyone, did everyone hear and understand her question? So 
just to summarize and clarify, it was such a great question. I wanted to make sure everyone got it. She grew up in a Christian family. Where are you from? Brazil. Brazil. So she grew up in a Christian family in Brazil. Now she's here. And she said in, in her youth, she had a lot of beautiful, beautiful experiences of God in the Christian framework and belief system that she had been raised in. Now she's here. She's having so many beautiful experiences of God in so many ways here. And she said, you know, she sings and she prays to God in the Arti and in the Kirtan. And she's having such deep experiences and she's sharing them online, on social media. And her, her friends and family are asking her, are you praying to other gods? Like, this is not okay. That you're doing something that's wrong. And so she's wondering, should I really share with them the depth of what I'm experiencing and try to convince them? Or would that be just useless? So first of all, It's beautiful, the experience you're having. What I can tell you, and you can feel free to share this with your friends and family, is that Preeti's recording it anyway, so we can, we can give it to you and you can share it with them, is that within the Hindu tradition, God is one. One of the greatest myths about Hinduism is that it's a polytheistic religion, that we have many gods. We do not. We have one God. In fact, it's even deeper than that. We believe there is nothing but God. And in that nothing but Godness, everything therefore is God. If God is the creator, then everything that has been created is infused with God. There is a lot of different metaphors and examples to help people understand. One of them, for example, is the sun is shining. You've got an infinite number of vessels on the ground, different sizes, different shapes, different colors, filled with different amounts of water. Each of them is going to give you a different reflection of the sun. But there's only one sun. It's just being reflected differently based on the different vessels. But the sun is one. So that's one way that we think about it. Another way is that we're told in the scriptures that whatever way the devotee worships me, however the devotee thinks about me, I appear to the devotee in that very form. So whatever, whatever works for the devotee, because within, within Hinduism, it's considered very important to be able to have a personal relationship with God. As you said, you have. But people have very different characteristics, very different sensibilities. And so it is seen as this graciousness of God to be willing to appear in this infinite number of ways so that everyone, depending on their sensibility, their way, can experience God. Even within all of our different names and forms of God, it's accepted, it's understood, they are all one. It's all one. Just different embodiments, different manifestations, different incarnations at different times in different ways. Another way to think about it is, you think your father, okay, one man, 
So at home, maybe he wears his jeans and t-shirt. Maybe your mom calls him honey or sweetheart. Then he goes to the office in a suit and tie and people call him sir or mister, whatever your last name is. Then he goes out and he plays tennis or golf or whatever he plays with his friends. And he wears his shorts or his tennis clothes or his golf clothes. And maybe they call him by whatever his first name is. Or just, hey buddy, right? His parents call him son. You call him dad. One man, so many different relationships. Based on all the different people in his life, different costumes, different relationships, different names. In the same way God has different relationships with everyone. Different forms, different names, no problem. But God is one. So that's, that's how we consider it. So what you should help your friends and family understand is you're not praying to different gods. You're praying to just cultural variations of the name and the form. It would be like if you went to church in France and you went to church in Spain and you went to church in Russia. They would speak about God with different names because they speak different languages. Songs would be different. Prayers would be different. Different cultures, different languages. In the same way, you're praying to God in cultural variations of names and forms and ways. And through these, you are experiencing a more infinite form of God. Now, I wouldn't try to shove that down their throats. It doesn't ever go over very well. But I would gently share it as just an offering. An offering. Here's what I have learned. Here's where I have been transformed. Here's something that really touched me. Keep it personal. Those who are ready and open to accept a greater experience, of the, a greater possibility of the experience of God will understand. Those who aren't won't. And that's okay. Their time will also come. Because ultimately, whatever we call God, God is in, as we always say, every blade of grass, every drop of water, every tree, because God has given them to us. The same way if your child or beloved paints you a picture, the beloved is in the picture. You see the picture, you love it, because your beloved's love is in the picture, whether it's artistically a good picture or not. Your beloved is in there. So you love it. The last thing I would tell you is I think actually in the Bible, in the words of Jesus Christ, I think there is actually even a calling to a greater and vaster vision. And here's why I think so. And I am I was raised Jewish. I was not raised Christian. I am not a scholar of Christianity by any means. But here's my understanding. He has given us an injunction to love thy neighbor as thyself, right? This is a very core teaching of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, I asked a lot of Christians I know, well, does he specify what he means by neighbor? Next door neighbor, one block, two blocks, ten blocks, one mile radius. And everyone said no, he, he didn't specify. Now, that's very interesting because 
if you're giving a teaching, you would be specific. I mean, if you only mean those on your block, you would say, love those on your block as thyself. Love those in a one mile radius as thyself. But he didn't give any specifics, which to me means that we cannot assume to put a border or boundary anywhere. We cannot say that we know what he meant when he didn't tell us. So there's no correct place to draw that line, which means ultimately we have to accept that the entire world is our neighbor because there's no place to draw the line. Now, most of us don't even know the names of everyone on our block let alone have the capacity to actually love them, right? I mean, if I say to you, raise your hand if you actually know the name of every person on your block. Does anyone even, even know that? Right? Not even one. So if we don't even know the name of everyone on our block, how can we love them? And that's only your block. And so it seems to me that the only actual way to follow that instruction, because I don't think he meant it as a suggestion or a vague idea. I think he meant it as a very literal instruction. And to me, the only way to do that is to love God and see everyone as God. Otherwise, there is no way to love everyone. You love God. You understand that you are God. Your capital S self is God. Because it doesn't say love everyone as thy body. Or love everyone as thy ego. Thyself. So I think about the capital S self. The only way to love all of those neighbors as thyself is you love God. You understand you are one with God. You understand, therefore, everyone is ultimately one with God. God is in everyone. And because you love God, you can love everyone. Like because you love your child, you will love every picture they draw. Doesn't matter. Even sight unseen, you know I will love it because your child made it. They say, Mom, I made you a new picture. You will love it. You think, of course I'm going to love it. Of course I'll love it. It'll go right up on the fridge. Of course I'll love it. You made it. So the only way to do that is to love God and see God in everyone. I cannot imagine another way you could fulfill that instruction. And so I actually believe that in that teaching is a calling to an expansive understanding of the presence of God. Yeah. Yes, last, we'll take yours. Pranam, Pranam. Uh, I have a query. I mean, uh, it is said that uh, when you are prepared, your guru comes in your life when you are prepared. So the, my question is, what should we do to prepare ourselves to get our gurus in our life? Beautiful. The best way to prepare yourself is to empty yourself. It's like... If you're going to a bandhara, a big bandhara, a big feast, okay, whether it's a langar, whether it's a shadi, either way, whatever type of food you're going to get, you are going to a wonderful feast. Well, would you eat a big meal before you went? Right? You'd want to make sure that you're hungry because you know... I'm about to get a lot of really good food. 
So you want to be hungry. And if you're going to one of those where you, it's, you know, an ashram or a langar where the sadhus and everyone are bringing their own utensils, you're bringing your own bowl. Well, would you bring the bowl full of something already? Like half full of, you know, your breakfast leftovers? Of course not. You'd make sure it's empty so that you can fill it. <coughs> with what they offer. In the same way. The best way to prepare for meeting the Guru, for having the Guru enter our life, is to empty ourselves. <coughs> because otherwise, we're in the presence of the Guru. And we're so full, so full already, that we cannot absorb, take in, what the Guru has to offer. It's like that story I tell all the time about the Guru offering the cup of tea. Well, as long as the cup is full, the Guru can't pour any more tea. Until and unless we drink the tea in the cup, there's no room for more. And in the same way, until and unless we empty ourselves, of who we think we are, what we think we know, what we think we need. There isn't any room. It's the, it's the equivalent of, you know, the tap is on, but your bucket is upside down. So you're not going to be able to get any water because the bucket will die. If you want to actually absorb water, you have to turn the bucket the right side up. In the same way, that grace is there, that presence is there. But if we are upside down in our mind, we can't take it, we can't absorb it. So focus on emptying yourself of ego, of ignorance, of false identification. Work on getting your internal bucket the right way up. And then you'll be able and ready to fully, fully absorb. Beautiful. Have a, um, aapki question, kal se shuru kare. Teek? Kali aap se shuru karenge. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your evening. Beautiful Basaki. A beautiful morning and day to our family joining us from all over the world. And so, so, so much love to you all. And I look so forward to being together tomorrow.